good to have some of you back from the uh, Great South, where you uh, enjoyed the bit of warmth that they had. I think they had a little bit of cold as well, but it's great to have you back home and uh, good to be with you. Got a message today from Ivan Hoyt, and they ask you to pray for him and his wife as they take on a new ministry in the Carlos Paz area of Argentina. And uh, we have to pray for our missionaries continually, and it's, I, I trust that you're doing that on a regular basis. Just a clarification so that you know that um, this Easter time, we're having our Good Friday service at 7 o'clock in the evening here at our church. And uh, this is the first time they've had it in nighttime or the, uh, in the evening time. So I uh, hope you'll come out and join us for that time of, of fellowship and also in the, uh, the Monday Thursday service as well. Well, a couple of weeks ago, we looked into the passages of Scripture in John chapter 5 and verses 1 to 18, and we talked about the baby steps of faith that led a man to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. He saw Jesus as the one who could heal his son. Remember that passage we were talking about? And he thought that Jesus had to be present right there in order to do the miracle. But Jesus wanted to prove that he had, was the God of distance and space, as well as the, having the ability to answer the request that we present before him. The distance and space are no obstacle with God. If you're praying for somebody in another part of the world, and we just mentioned the, the Hoyts as the missionaries, we're praying for our missionaries. As we pray here, God's answering there. And he knows exactly what we're praying about. And we have people and family members, perhaps in other parts of Michigan and other parts of the uh, United States and maybe throughout the world, and we are concerned about them. God is there and able to answer those prayers. Jesus told this man to go. The son, some 20 miles away from there, would be healed. second step of faith for this man was when he actually turned and started to walk back home in faith, believing that Jesus would answer the prayer. And you remember that the family came out, his servants came out to greet him and to tell him the good news that the moment that Jesus said, your son would be healed, his son was healed. Jesus is faithful in answering our prayers. And we fully entrust our lives to him as our master. Well, today I want to go to the third miracle, which we find in chapter 6. And we realize that, I should say, in chapter 5, and verses 1 to 18. We find this third miracle is a miracle which is quite different from the first two. Remember, the first one was in the wedding, where Jesus dealt with the home and the marriage. Second one was with a child, where God reaches down and touches a child and heals him. The third one is an elderly man gathered by a pool in the middle of Jerusalem in the time of a feast. This man had 38 years being afflicted with an illness. Each one of the miracles that we've talked about shows a different aspect of Jesus Christ. And the first one we realize that he's the God of quality, master of quality. And the second miracle we find that he's the master of distance and space, that nothing can come between him and us, and he can answer our prayers in time and space and we, do, we can depend upon him. In this miracle, we find he's the master of time. That the length of time that someone is sick, it doesn't mean anything to God. He can touch them and he can heal them. Have you ever had something bother you for a long time? Have you ever had a problem that perhaps is a sin, a habit, an illness, 
a personal problem, something you have had a lot of trouble trying to get rid of. And day after day you agonize over this issue, but nothing seems to change. You may have gone to others for help, but the problem still remains. When John 5, 5 starts this story with a man who experienced a sickness for 38 years. It was not only physically debilitating for him, but it became emotionally draining. He had lost all hope that he could ever get to where he wanted to go with this illness. He was sitting beside a pool on a mat, and all he had to do was to be able to, according to him anyway, was to walk over and drop into the pool the time it was disturbed, the water was stirring, and he'd be healed. But he couldn't get there. Every time he tried to get there, someone else got there before him. Kind of frustrating, wouldn't it be? Seeing a man for 38 years not being able to move five feet to be able to drop into a pool. Put yourself in that situation. And every time you think you're going to get there in time, someone else beats you to it. And you don't get to realize the experience. Hoping, his hope was that lost and he had everything he thought of, he thought that in his life he was just every day going to be a cripple on a mat. In this passage in John 5, 1 to 18, we will see the inability of the man to meet his own needs. We'll see our inability to meet our own needs. We'll also see the inability of God, the ability of God to heal him instantly. We'll see the reaction of the heartless world to the miraculous cure. And we'll also see that Christ as God performed the work of his heavenly Father in accomplishing this. It says it starts out, oh, there's a feast. It doesn't tell us what feast it is, but if it's the Passover, we know that Jerusalem is just full of people. Lots of people. When the feast time came, whether the Feast of Tabernacles or whatever it happened to be, everybody went all from every place they could. They crowded into Jerusalem for the feast. And so everyone was crowded around in that place filled with people celebrating the exercise of the religious belief, but they were ignoring the people who were in desperate shape around them. People meeting their own needs, not the needs of others. But not Jesus. Jesus went down to the pool where the lame, the blind, and the invalid people were gathered. Jesus wasn't on that particular day, he wasn't gathering in the temple. He was down where the people were hurting. He was mingling amongst the destitute, while the others were preoccupied with religious practices. The Son of God was not leading the religious fanatics in their ritual, but he was ministering to the lame, the helpless, the obscure, in a very obscure corner of the city. Sometimes we say, I want to be like Jesus. If we want to be like Jesus, where are we working? Are we so involved with our religious activity that we forget that people around us are hurting? When Jesus wanted to, this is a Sabbath day, and we'll find out that. It was a day when everybody gathered in the temple. Except the Lord Jesus felt it was more important to gather with people who were hurting and to reach out to those people and to meet their needs. He spent the day and his time and energy with people. There was a pool there called Bethesda. Pool of mercy is what that word means. 
Some uh, obscure manuscripts add, waiting for the moving of the waters, a time for an angel of the Lord would come down and stir up the waters. First into the pool would be cured in whatever disease he had. We don't know whether that was actually, in most manuscripts that's not found, and especially in the oldest manuscripts not found. So whether this was true or not, or whether it was just a footnote put in the later on in the later manuscripts, we don't know by a scribe. But somewhere along the line, the, the tradition was, or the realization was that when the waters moved in that pool, you had to get in. You had one chance, and then when the water stopped moving, you wouldn't be cured. Whether it was an angel that God has sent at that time, we don't know. Because we don't have the, the background to say here whether this part was really part of the original text. It certainly wasn't part of the original text, but it may have been a fact that these waters were special for the people who had come to sit beside them. So the water was stirring and the man couldn't move. The invalid man, 38 years suffering with his problem. Probably three quarters of his life. Now, uh, invalid, it usually implies in the Greek that it's paralyzed. You get paralyzed for a number of different reasons. But this man couldn't move. From the waist down, he could not move. And those days, didn't have wheelchairs, didn't have any kind of uh, apparatus to move yourself. So he had to drag himself to the pool side and get in and tie. Physically suffering with no cure, mentally giving up with no hope. Perhaps it hasn't been 38 years for you to suffer on something. Perhaps you've had something though in your life and you said, I've had an awful long time, God doesn't seem to be doing anything about it. And you're waiting hopelessly feeling that things will never change for you. Could be a health problem like this man. Social issue in your life. Being stuck in a job with no future. Or a relationship that doesn't grow or change. And we go on day after day, year after year. And it seems that things don't change. If you've been in that situation, you'll understand what this man feels like inside. He's there and he can't get to the pool's edge. Have you given up? I hope not. Because God is still there for us. God is there in the midst of our situation. Maybe we've talked to God about it and we've decided that God isn't going to answer our prayers according to the way we, we've asked them. We didn't get the answer we wanted. We just resigned ourselves to the fact that we're going to sit by the pool and wait. Perhaps even a root of bitterness has crept in. You know, it's so easy when we get into a situation of our life where we don't see a solution to have a root of bitterness kind of crawl inside and, and start to take over. And we get bitter about the things that are going on around us and become angry inside. Well, one thing we look in verse 6. Jesus knew his condition. He knew exactly his condition. He saw the need as actually was. He reached out to meet the need. And he is able to overcome any obstacle of time. He's the master of time. Jesus asked him a simple question. Do you want to get well? Well, I think our answer would be, of course I want to get well. That was his answer. Of course I want to get well. But you know, sometimes when Jesus, God asks us a question, or we're asked the question, do we want to get well? It's not necessarily yes. Sometimes we don't want God to interfere in the things of our life. And we leave him out. And we don't use him as part and ask him to help us in our time of need. Some people, when confronted with the conditions and crisis and solution, decline the help in their lives. Some people are so locked into their problem and self-pity, the attention that they receive from their problem, they no longer seek a solution to their problem. And sometimes the very fear of, being, of change taking place in our lives. Just feeling that 
hey, you know, I don't know where I can live differently. Just imagine sitting on a mat for 38 years. You wouldn't know any other kind of life, would you? You wouldn't know what life was out in, like in other parts of the city. And sometimes we get in that condition in our own life and we don't know and we're afraid to move off our mat. Because for us, the only solution we have in our mind is we've got to get to the pool. Because that's the only way and the only solution that we have. Jesus asked this question because he won't do anything against our will. He asked the man, do you want to be healed? He is searching the man's heart. He's searching our hearts. Asking us the question, do we want to be healed? Do we want things to change in our life? Are we willing to accept those changes? If God were to do a miracle in our lives. Do we want victory over our problems and our situation? Do we want Jesus to help us? Well, the man's reply was very simple. I've gone no one to help me into the pool. You see, the pool was this man's solution. What is your solution in your life? It's the only hope this man had was the, that the pool had to be the only answer to it. Sometimes we set up an obstacle in our life and we say, if I don't get that, then I'm not going to be satisfied in my life. Maybe it's something we're asking God to do and we have set up our parameters of how it should be done. We've told God that if it doesn't work in this particular way, if you don't put me in the pool, there's no way I can get cured. Because we've set the parameters of how we can want to be healed. How we want our life to change for us. Do you understand what I'm meaning? That we sometimes put something there and we say, God, you've got to do it this way. You've got to work within my parameters. For this man, the only cure he could see was the pool. The only way out was to be in the pool. He had a tunnel vision. He was totally frustrated by not being able to help himself. He was depending on other people for help, and they were failing him. No one came alongside to lift him up and put him in the pool. I'm all alone in this. I can't do it by myself. What are you depending for your long-term needs? What is your pool in your life? What have you set up before God and said, if you don't do it this way, God, I can't see any answer to, to the needs I have. Now you got so wrapped up in your problem and self-pity you can't see any other way out. This man couldn't. <coughs> when he recognized his inadequacies, then he was open to God to do the work. What would have happened to the man who said, no, I'm okay. Uh, next time, I'll be the first one in. I, I don't need you, Lord. I don't need you in my life. I can handle it. I can handle my own problems. Don't worry. The last time, I got almost to the edge. Isn't that the way we'd think sometimes? Almost to the edge. I don't need your help. I can handle life on my own. Sometimes that's the way we respond to God. You know, Jesus would have walked away if the man had said that to him. Because Jesus won't go against our will. Man was relying on the pool for help. And Jesus was offering himself instead of the pool. As long as we depend on something or someone else to solve our problems and not God, and not on God's terms, we will remain on a mat beside the pool. Jesus' command to this man, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. 
Get up. Pick up your mat and walk. Now Jesus had nothing to do with the pool. He didn't even mention the pool. He didn't even mention the need to go to the pool. He just says, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. So we find that in that situation, that Jesus is telling him, depend on me. Put all your burdens upon me. Don't worry about the pool as your solution. Don't worry about people leaving you alone. Don't worry about your situation. Rise up, take your mat, and walk. Simple obedience to a stern command. He never asked a man to have faith in the pool. He only asked man to have faith in himself. Who are we depending on in our faith? Is it the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, there was instant healing for this man. He picked up his mat and he walked. 38 years of sitting on the mat was gone. Now he could see the rest of Jerusalem. No pool, no angel, no commotion in the water, just Jesus. I trust in our lives we come to the place where we're willing to say, just Jesus. Just Jesus is the answer to my problems. Not the things that I've set up. Not the things that seem to be in motion in the world around me. My solution to my problems is Jesus. But there's an interesting twist in this story. The religious police came along, the Pharisees. They said to the man, it's Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. Now this guy had been 38 years on a mat. 38 years on a mat. And he finally got to stand up and walk. And Jesus told him to pick up his mat and walk. Because he need, didn't need to come back to that place anymore. And he's walking around with his mat under his arm. And he's walking by and the Pharisee says, Hey, you're carrying your mat on the Sabbath and that's against the law. Can you imagine what it would be like? What would you think inside your heart? Huh? He didn't care about the miracle. He just cares about the mat. How often in our Christian life have we condemned someone else for some little simple thing like carrying their mat? We become so obsessed with our own spiritual or religious practice that when someone's walking around with a mat, we call them down for it. When in actuality, what we need to say is, praise God, you're walking with your mat. Do you understand what I'm saying? Sometimes we can go so caught up in our religious practices and thinking. The law, according to them, and this was not a law from the Bible. This is a law that man had created. This is one of those 3,200 laws that had been added to the Old Testament and taken out of context. And then somehow they got to the place where walking on the Sabbath with your mat, even if you'd just been healed, was wrong. The Pharisee ignored the meal, the miracle, and invoked the law. They didn't have interest in people, just rules. Well, have we ever come to the place in our Christian life where we stop to think about people and we're just interested in the rules, we've got a problem. Sometimes our self-imposed belief systems can interfere with our faith. Many people have been turned off to Christianity because someone said to them, you're carrying your mat. When in actuality, they should have said to him, Praise God. There's hope for you in Jesus Christ. Trying to change the practice before we change the heart. That's what the Pharisees were trying to do. So the Pharisee inquired, Who was it who told you with your mat? Motivated to condemn Jesus. 
Well, Jesus went back and talked to this man. Later he saw him in the, some aspect of the temple. And he told the man, he started to deal with the man's heart. The first time he dealt with his illness, the second time he dealt with his heart. He said to the man, you are well again. Physically, emotionally healed. Stop sinning or something worse will happen to you. So the man was able to see that Jesus can change the heart completely. In the Greek language, when it says stop doing these things and go on, he isn't referring to his past sin. He didn't say that his 38 years on the mat was caused by sin. What he's really saying is, from this time on, change your life. Go forward and live for me. And sometimes there's things in our lives and we keep going back into our old place and we keep going back on the mat again in our thinking and we say, God, I have this problem and I, I can't get rid of it. And we keep thinking about the old things in our lives. When in actuality we need to start where we are and say, Lord, forgetting the past, the sins I've asked you to forgive, I want to leave in the past. I want to take up my mat. I want to walk forward, and I do not want to sin anymore. And that's what Jesus was basically telling him to do in our, his life. You are cured physically. Now get your heart right spiritually. Avoid future calamity caused by sin. Walk with me. It's one thing to ask Jesus to help out in our immediate situation and problems. But he wants our hearts yielded to him. He wants the whole of us. He wants everything yielded to him. He wants us to walk close to him so we can avoid future problems caused by disobedience. This man was obedient in getting up and taking his mat and walking. Now he needed to commit his life in full obedience and walking with God. Well, the, the, go on in this passage, you look at the Pharisees and how they treated this man. And later on, they came to the man and they asked him a question. Again, who healed you? Or I say, who, who, caused, who asked you to take up your mat? The man turned back and said, it's Jesus who healed me. You see, for the man, he realized the miracle was in the healing, not in the walking with the mat. It was in the realization that Jesus could make a difference in life. Jesus claimed to the Pharisees later on, I'm continuing to do the work of my father. The work that he was doing was God's work. God is in the business of changing life, living vibrant lives, transforming work in our lives. Where are we in our lives? Are we on a mat somewhere? Waiting for something to happen? Are we putting our trust in the pool? Then maybe the things we set up, maybe it's, God, I, I, I have to win the lottery, even though I don't buy a ticket. Or maybe it's something that we've placed up there and said, you know, I know it's 1.8 billion people that are in the publisher's clearinghouse, but I believe you, that's the solution for my life. You're going to give me that amount of money. Or maybe it's something else we've set up, and we say, if only that would happen, then I'd be all right. This passage teaches us our dependence needs to be on the Lord Jesus Christ. On whom are you depending for the solution of your problems today? For this man, it was Jesus. For us, it needs to be the same. He has all the power and authority to transform. He's a master of time, can change hearts and lives of people everywhere. Even you and me. Isn't that wonderful? That's what's precious about the Word of God. It didn't take a mat. It didn't take a pool for him to act. He can act instantaneously and do the work of God.
Father, help us to understand that in our lives. Help us to realize what it is to have full trust in you. And this man didn't even need trust. You just acted. I thank you, Lord, that in sometimes in our lives when we don't even know you're working. Help us not to trust in other things, but put our trust fully in you, Lord. Father, we pray that we would also be a people not bound by rules, but bound by the grace of God to help others to carry their mat. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.